Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Rothwell. I work at Microsoft in the UK. Uh, I work as part of our small and medium business team. And most of my time, really, I'm helping our partners and our customers think about how they can make better use of the technology that we build in order to grow their businesses and be more effective. Um, I've got about half an hour, I think. Um, and I sort of have this kind of slightly grand title of my presentation about business reimagined. And really what I'm going to talk about is a little bit of the trends that we see. I'll probably touch on to, to Andrew's point some of the ways that Microsoft is changing as a result of that. But then really look at how those technology trends are impacting the way that people work. And how is that impacting the way that people get their work done, how people feel about working, uh, where they're working and all those kind of aspects. Um, and it's great to be here and hearing about how you are becoming more connected. Uh, we know we're, we are beginning to see that the, the impact that has, there's, you saw the estimate in terms of economic value that delivers, but it's changing the access that people have, the work that they can do, and how they become uh, more involved. So I'll start really kind of quite high level and say there are four, it's a wonderful phrase, technology megatrend. It sounds like a baddie in a film to me, but it's something that the technology industry have adopted. Uh, so these megatrends, they talk about sort of four fairly pervasive trends that pretty much work as a thread through most of the changes that you can see within the technology industry. It's not exhaustive. You can probably sit there and think, oh, actually, you know, I think there's a different trend or I disagree with one of those. But I think they're pretty broad and they're pretty, uh, pretty well understood. And largely, when you look at the things that Microsoft is investing in, these, these are some of those things. Andrew talked about Yammer and social. It's a big investment from Microsoft as an acquisition that we made a couple of years ago. And, and we have investments in all of those areas. However, when I think about the small, smaller organizations, I really think there have been two massive changes over the last probably five years that have dramatically changed the way that people use technology. The first one I'm going to talk about is consumerization of IT, which is really just a fancy way of saying she's the rise of more personal computing. Given that we call these things PCs, probably we didn't find them all that personal. If you think back uh, to the year 2000, how many people were using PCs as part of their everyday life at work? Okay. How many people were using PCs at home? Okay. How many people had a better PC at home than they did at work? Ooh, okay. Split. Okay. Uh, now, how many people have a better phone than the PC at work? Yeah, certainly I do. Right? Okay. Uh, and that's really the trend that we see. Right? Um, you used to have this situation of, you know, a desktop, it was wedded to the place that you worked. Um, you started it in the morning, then you went to make tea, then you came back, let it finish loading. Uh, several points during the day, you felt like throwing it out of the window. Um, now people are buying their own devices. They're actually much faster than they used to be. They're incredibly well connected. They're amazingly powerful. And it is changing the way that people not just use technology, but the way they think about technology and what they expect from it. Uh, now you probably think that buying software that comes from an app store, that 99p is quite expensive, um, and you expect it to be pretty much instant and beautiful and wonderful and flawless. That's very different from what you thought about technology a few years ago. The other big trend that's impacting small and medium organizations is the rise of the cloud. And really that is you know, part of why probably you're all here today and it's all about being better connected. But fundamentally the cloud is giving people access to services, storage, technology, information that quite frankly was prohibitively expensive before. And so those two things combined, you start having these amazingly smart, powerful, connected devices that now have access to services that are running at massive scale by large providers like Microsoft or other local organizations who are doing sort of particular services requirements, then you begin to weave those two things together. It has a transformational impact on the way that people use IT. What does that actually mean when you boil it down? Well, I mean, number one is saving organizations money. Um, if nothing else, people have gone from a world where they were spending uh, probably tens of thousands of pounds on an IT project, and they were paying all that money up front, and they were really hoping it was going to work. Uh, you spent the money. Maybe, you know, certainly in larger organizations, we see very, very long IT projects that maybe or maybe don't deliver the value that they had originally intended. 
with things like cloud, you start with five users and you're paying for five users. And if it's not really working out, you cancel those five users and you've spent you know, six months of five users. You've not invested the money. And obviously, that has a massive impact on cash flow. Also changes how flexible you can be as an organization. And I'm, I partly mean flexibility in that ability to scale up and down. You know, today I, um, you know, well, it would be a good example. Let's say, um, you know, if one of you runs a, a website, uh, it typically has, you know, a few thousand visitors a day. And then whatever, you know, it's mentioned on the Today program or on Radio 1, depending on, on, on who your demographic would be. And it goes from having a few thousand visitors a day to a few million visitors in a day. Actually, why doesn't that service just expand, allow me to pay for the access that those few million people need, and then if it drops off again, I'll stop paying that amount. I don't want to have to build infrastructure or services that are designed to run for millions of users when I don't normally have millions of users. Uh, there's a great story with Domino's, Domino's Pizza in the US. There is one day in the year in, in, in America where Domino's has 50 times the demand of any other day. Uh, that, that Super Bowl Sunday. And so their website runs in a cloud service run by Microsoft that means that they pay for what they use. They don't have to build and pay for infrastructure that's capable of running that all of the time. The other element of flexibility, though, is changing how people work. Um, you know, I talked about a PC sat on your desk. You, know, you really had to be in the office in order to, to make use of that device and have access to the information, access to the server, access to, to the information that you're working with. Um, cloud services and devices are really giving you the ability to work from anywhere that you want to. As long as you can get online, you have access to that information, access to people, access to resources, access to communication, and that's allowing you to work differently. Uh, we could probably debate for the rest of the day whether that is all good or bad or somewhere in between, um, and depending on how you feel about it may, well, uh, may, may vary a lot, but it's certainly giving organizations more choice. And the last one, I called it powerful tools, but really what I mean is just that, quite frankly, there's just access to greater technology. Um, many of the things that are now available on a monthly subscription were prohibitively expensive for small organizations. They were only really in the domain of some of the very largest organizations, and they were investing millions in order to make them work. Um, now they're available. Yeah? And very sophisticated tools come in the form of apps, in the form of web services, in, the, in connections, um, and that's fantastic. That is giving you more power, more tools in order to go and compete effectively from wherever you are in the world with some of the largest organizations. And you see that in industries being disrupted by small organizations with great ideas, great people, and a really agile mindset. So I think those three things combined mean that you have an incredibly exciting time to be thinking about how to use technology in order to drive your business. So the things that I really wanted to talk about, though, is what does all of that mean for the way that you work? Um, I'm a big believer in this sort of phrase in the middle of the slide that technology should always be about enabling people. When you boil it down, people are really your only asset. You know, if you've got great processes, they were created by great people. If you have great salespeople, they're people dealing with people. Um, if you have great creative people, like, it's all about how you amplify the impact of those individuals and make sure they're doing the things that matter most when it works for them, when it works for your customers, how do you be more agile, more responsive, and how are you enabling those people to have the best impact every day? Three trends that I think those sort of broad technology trends around cloud and consumerization and all of those different threads are pulling together. Three, there, we could pick many more, and probably you have many that you think of yourselves as, as kind of trends that you need to be thinking about from a technology perspective. But here are the three that I've picked that I think are really uh, transforming the way that small businesses think about technology. I'm going to start by thinking about anywhere working. Um, work is no longer a place, but an activity. Uh, we still have quite an industrial attitude towards work, really. Um, we measure people like, OK, I want you in the office by 9. Nobody leaves before 5.30. And actually, people don't leave before 6, because no one leaves before 6. And so nobody wants to be the first person to go. It sort of begins to get this cultural uh, attitude within organizations about presenteeism and it's about how long you're there rather than what you do while you are there. But I think that slowly is changing. And certainly in um, some organizations, that's changed dramatically. And people are moving much more to think about outcomes and accountability and the results that you drive rather than necessarily how long you're working. And they're giving people more flexibility in order to work that way. There's an example here. It's from quite a large organization in Accenture. But this is one of the managing directors at Accenture, a very senior partner there. 
Um, and he, is a, he truly embraces the mobile working idea. Um, he carries a laptop, a tablet, and a phone, and that goes with him pretty much everywhere that he goes, whether that's home, traveling, uh, various Accenture offices around the world, and um, airports, cafes, wherever he feels that he could be most productive at that moment in time. The thing that I think really is most interesting about Mike's story is that he talks very much about being most effective given where he is. He says that if he's in the office, then that's all about people. He doesn't want to sit and do email when he's in the office. Being in the office is about connecting with people, spending time talking, meeting groups of people. It's about establishing those social connections, building on them and revisiting them and making sure you have, have those personal connections to continue to build on. And then email maybe he does late at night because he didn't want to work that morning. He's able to flex his day in order to suit himself. And the point I think that we've got to try to put across at the bottom is that mobile working culture is you know, partly about the devices that you have. Yeah, you do need something that's mobile, of course. It could be a mobile phone, it could be a laptop, it could be a tablet. You have a range of options. Of course, it's about access, whether that's using the cloud or using technology to access information you have within your office. But it, mostly it's about culture. And you can start to think about how do you weave all of those things together. I talked a little bit about this at the beginning in terms of the, the, you know, the rise of personal computing and people's PCs at home being better than their PC at work. You now have this, uh, you actually, you know what, my laptop's better than yours and I'd much rather use mine. Um, so I don't know, does anybody in here have sort of a bring your own device type policy at work? Actually, no, uh, only a couple of people. So we're seeing more and more of that. And that's really because employees get given a laptop that maybe is a little bit older, maybe a little bit slower, and they've got one that they'd much rather use. And so, quite frankly, they just want to bring it, connect it to the network, and get on, with their, get on with their job. And we see more and more of this and more and more companies embracing it and, and allowing employees to work on any device that they choose. I should have asked at the beginning. An average is 3.3. How many people have got... Three connected devices with them today. Laptops, phones, tablets. Four? Five? Oh, you're my hero. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we quite often play a game to see how many connected devices people have in their home. I think I'm up to about 25 now by the time you take everything that connects online. Um, but increasingly, people switch between devices depending on what they're doing. Um, I find myself sat in the same place, and for some things, my phone is the best thing to do something. Other times, I'll pick up a tablet. Other times, I want to work on a laptop. Then I might actually move to a full PC where I've got beautiful screens and lots of space to go and use. You want to be able to move seamlessly between all of those, and increasingly, people are bringing their own devices in order to make that happen. We, um, we did some work with Regis a couple of years ago, uh, some sort of rent flexible office space, as many of you probably know. Um, and it turns out that actually working remotely is mostly about trust, and it creates this wonderful experience for people. Um, I'm sure none of you have ever done this, but I bet everybody knows somebody that has. Um, you're working at home, so you think, okay, just woken up, it's eight o'clock, just send a quick email. Then I'll have breakfast, cup of tea, get myself ready, shower, and then I'll get back onto it. But I'll send a quick email, for, let everybody know that I'm awake, that I'm working hard. <laughs> I'm on it today, I'm on it. And then maybe I'll work throughout the day, maybe I work incredibly hard. And in fact, you know, certainly my own experience is I, I can be very effective when I work at home, turning through tasks. It's very good for certain things that I do. Uh, and then you finish your day, maybe you cook dinner, sit down, maybe you're having a glass of wine, you think, nine o'clock, just pop an email to my boss. <laughs> It's good, good for him to know, good for him to know that 9 o'clock I'm still on it. And, and the people that do that do it because they think everybody, no one believes that you work when you're at home. Right? You know, there's this amazing sort of cynical attitude towards, oh, you're having a uh, working from home day uh, out last night. That's the sort of comments that you hear. And actually, that's crazy. Right? People work harder when they're at home. They get more done. They're more effective. It's quiet. It's great for some tasks. It's not great for everything, and you want to be able to use the right, right tool for the right policy. But uh, it is about instilling that culture, about instilling that trust, and that's a lot about leadership uh, and how you establish that from the very top of your organization and make sure those sorts of things feel acceptable. The next trend I wanted to talk about was business insight. Um, this slide, really, all it says is you know, data is growing incredibly quickly. Um, there are sort of, probably the only thing growing faster is stats about how fast business data is growing. But definitely, you know, we are creating more and more data. And the comment on the left from Gartner, you know, a, a, an IT analyst house, all it really says is, if you do a good job of using your data, you'll be more effective. 
And uh, my, my view right now from sort of talking a lot to our partners and our customers is that data is really, we're only really at the beginning of understanding what it can do for us. Um, I think you could liken our attitude towards data as a little bit like the way that teenagers think about sex. Uh, they think everybody else is doing it. If they are doing it, they're not that sure if they're doing it right, and they feel a little bit uncomfortable about the whole thing. So why is it really important? Well, because actually it's enabling us to ask a whole different set of questions. Typically, we've asked fairly dull questions, important questions, but not that interesting. Yeah, how much did I sell? Yeah, that's okay. That's probably a, that's a great question to be able to answer. But actually, is it really changing your business? Is it giving you a competitive advantage? And increasingly, you see these sorts of questions being asked and organizations set up to help answer that. Social, I think, is incredibly interesting. It's, it's already surfaced a few times this morning in the way that social becomes something for you to in interact with your customers and also just learn a tremendous amount about the market. There's, there are companies now that will begin to tell you uh, how they predict that your sales and market share will change over time based on the sentiment that they pick up from social media. Uh, I, think, I think it's now de facto that the way to complain is a strongly worded tweet. Nobody writes a letter anymore. If you can't complain in 160 characters or less, then you haven't thought enough about it. Yeah, it's a quick rage tweet is nothing like the way to get a company's attention. And companies now, if they haven't responded in 24 hours, oh, dead to me. It's unbelievable the change that that has driven in the way that people think about interacting with, with organizations of any size. And, and being able to track that and see what's happening and be able to model it over time is incredibly powerful. Real-time data, in the example here is for sort of uh, travel and logistic type companies on the fly being able to make route changes and being able to coordinate that. If you think about organizations that, um, you know, typically supermarkets are a good example where deliveries are scheduled in, um, you know, sort of five to ten minute windows, if you begin to get those wrong, there is literally no space for lorries. They, you know, you kind of have complete chaos in the roads because they don't stack up. Being able to get that right is incredibly important. It's reliant on data and modeling. And the final one is just the, the advanced analytics that you can now perform in order to get better insight from collections of data and combining those together. This is something that we do a lot of. Um, we have one particular tool that probably everybody in the room has at least seen, um, which is Excel. And Excel is great for creating tables, and it's also great for helping you get insight out of that data. It's not just about collection, it's about helping you interpret that. We have a whole range of tools that make that, that easier to do. But Excel is typically the front end, and I just wanted to give a couple of examples of ways that we're trying to make that easier for you to understand what's going on. Um, I haven't got a screenshot of it, but you can all imagine just a table of data. It's very difficult to interpret that and begin to see what's good, what's bad, what's exciting. There you have Power Map that's just showing you. I mean, I think the blue chart, the blue bar in the middle, begins to deserve you know, greater investigation. Something is happening wherever that is. Something is happening that is good or bad, depending on what my data is telling me, and I want to go and investigate that differently. And here we have something called PowerView, which enables you to slice, dice, and interpret your data uh, very quickly and in lots of different ways. And similarly, you can see spikes in your blue line on the top chart. You can see the way that trending is happening over time. This is the stuff that takes data and turns it into insight that allows you to make better decisions and able to turn that into business outcomes. And that, I think, is incredibly exciting. Social. You could probably, if, actually, if I just stopped there and said social, I would think, uh, well, there's probably about 60-ish people in the room. I reckon there'd be at least 60 different interpretations of what I meant by social. Uh, I think that's, that's probably a good, good idea. Um, in this particular instance, I'm predominantly talking about how, how organizations can work more socially within themselves which maybe sounds odd. We, we, lots of people talk a lot about how they use social media, um, things like Facebook and Twitter, particularly in how they reach customers. But actually, if you think about social as a way of working, um, that is beginning to change for the better in, in every single way. The tools that we use in the workplace and how we think about collaborating with different people. So <coughs> this probably won't surprise anybody either. If anybody, is anybody in the room work for a really large organization? Uh, sort of, you know, kind of big, big multinational. Yeah, a handful of you. So the, this is, you know, probably the, the typical uh, office cubicle joke. Dilbert probably thrives on this. Um, people just, actually, they're not that engaged in their job. You know, turn up, get paid, go home. Done. I'm not that interested. And 
when you think about the way that people interact with tools in their personal life, they're really comfortable sharing things. Uh, you go to Facebook and you're happy to say, hey, this is what I'm doing today, this is what I've done today, this is what I'm doing tomorrow. And then you prompt all sorts of interactions, whether that's as simple as a like or someone commenting. And how many serendipitous connections do you find by saying, hey, I'm going to this tomorrow. One of your friends says, hey, I'm there too. Do you want to meet? Oh, fantastic. Haven't seen you in a couple of years. It'd be great to meet up. Taking that kind of approach and applying it into a business context, and really, email's not that great for that. I don't know. Does anybody in the room not get enough email? <laughs> what, no one? Oh, amazing. Can't believe it. Uh, we tend to be really slavishly driven by email. Right? And you know, uh, we now get it everywhere. It's really convenient. Um, I have more of it on my phone than I would like. It's great to deal with it on my phone. But actually, it's not that great a tool to collaborate. And so starting to think about how you weave people together in a more collaborative way uh, begins to drive better business outcomes. And actually, no, David, did, I'm sorry, Andrew did a great job of um, mentioning that with the, the story of British Airways, which I'll come on to in a second. That's a big change, though. And actually, this is something that Microsoft is going through right now. We bought this company called Yammer. Um, we are now busy adopting Yammer inside Microsoft. And as you can probably imagine, People that work at Microsoft are relatively happy trying new technology. Right? We do that a lot of the time. We're very good at trying stuff even before we finish building it. We're usually pretty happy to adopt it. But it's a massive change in working style for us. And it's a change from being you know, one to one, one to few private communication on, uh, in email to actually an open communication and open collaboration where you start broadcasting and sharing across the whole organization this is what I'm working on. This is a question that I've got. Does anybody know about this? And it is incredible the number of people who are happy and willing to contribute and bring their own expertise into parts of the business that they don't work in and that actually are not that relevant for them, but they happen to know about or they happen to have some experience. And really changing the way that you work and changing the way that you communicate is driving agility. The example for British Airways, um, yes, it's about people. It's actually British Airways is a great example of where they're using their own mobile phones. It's bring your own device. Like people have got a, got a phone that they travel around the world with. They want to use that. They're using Yammer in order to be able to connect with people that they fly with on different crews and different routes. But it's also a way for the management of British Airways to connect with and share what they're doing with the people who are best connected to the customers, the people who spend you know, 8, 10, 11, 12 hours uh, in a small tube with them and understand that. And they have some really nice examples of where um, you know, they, British Airways management said, actually, we're thinking about doing this, this change. Uh, I think there was few around how they were going to change first class travel. And plenty of the cabin crew actually started to contribute and say, it's madness. Right? Customers love that. That is an amazing thing. That, that, you know, that, I've never had a customer that's been unhappy about that. Why are we going to do that? And as a result, decision changed. Much more responsive, much more reflective of the needs of the customer. And just being able to bring that out into the open makes a tremendous difference. So three trends. Anywhere working, business insights, social. What is it that we're doing? I said that we were investing all of those sort of trends, and that is certainly true. Um, the way that we now really talk about Microsoft and what it is that we're doing is we talk about being a devices and services company. Um, that's you know making sure that we want you to have a great experience on one of these, and we also want you to have fantastic services that help connect those together. Um, whether that is on big screen, tiny screen, or any size in between, and some of the services are busy sort of flashing around on the screen in front of you. But increasingly, you know, the company is changing. And if anybody sort of you know, followed Microsoft or is vaguely aware of what's happening in the technology industry, we've made a number of announcements recently that are quite different for Microsoft. How many people in the room have got an iPad? OK, good. Uh, we've recently shipped Office on the iPad. Um, people that are long-time Microsoft observers would have said, you know, it'd be a cold day in hell when that happens. Okay, apparently it's pretty chilly in hell right now. Uh, we've now shipped Office for iPad. You know, we create services like OneNote. I don't know, does anyone use OneNote? Okay, anybody with an iPad, anybody with any Windows device, you should use OneNote. Anyone with a Mac, right? It's an incredible note-taking application that syncs to the cloud and replicates your notes every, to every device that you're using. It's an incredibly cool tool, and it's now free. 
Right? So we're building OneNote, we're building Office. With Office 365, it lights up your subscription and on Office. With, um, with iPad, you can then begin to edit your Office documents. That's an incredible change for us. And it's reflective of the fact that we want customers, whether they are consumers or businesses, to have great computing experiences with our devices and our services, irrespective of which device you want to use on. And so it's, I think it's really reflecting the way that people are beginning to change how they work. With that in mind, there are a few customers that are, that are adopting our technology. It's just a handful. and some, We've already talked about the British Airways example, uh, which is great. Um, Metro Bank are using our dynamic services. Metro Bank, I think, are the first new high street bank in something like 120 years. They're really beginning to be quite disruptive. They think about their branches as stores. You get your cash cards instantly, uh, very heavily technology-led, and they're using Microsoft technology to power that experience. And actually, they use a number of our devices. The Surface PC, the Surface tablets are in their stores as a way for people to access services. Foxtons. Foxtons are using Windows Phone 8. Um, if you've never seen Windows Phone 8, I'll happily show you. Uh, I'm running the sort of the slightly pre-release of Windows Phone 8.1, uh, but I'll show you what it looks like. Foxtons are using that in order to power the way that they work. Right? I mean, if you think about an estate agent, being physically on site where the properties are is quite important. Um, and they're using the phone as a way to keep in touch with the office. They take photos. They're automatically sent back to the office. They're then incorporated into literature. Literature's printed before the person's even got back to the office. Like the workflow that they're saving as a result of that uh, is incredible. Uh, Delta have put Microsoft tablets into all of their cockpits. So if you're on a Delta flight, they will now be using a Microsoft tablet as a way to uh, have replaced the sort of thick flight book that they would have had printed before, give them access to that. And then Office 365. How many people have heard of Office 365? Well, that is reassuring. Uh, great. Um, how many people are using Office 365? Okay, let's do a good number. So Office 365 is the fastest growing product that Microsoft's ever built. Uh, fastest to reach a billion dollars worldwide. And the adoption that we're seeing, particularly actually in the small to medium sized organization is incredible. And that's partly because it's helping people like change the way that they pay. And so it's a subscription product, it's very low cost to get started. It's giving people access to the latest and greatest version of Office and we're updating that pretty regularly so you stay current. But it's also giving you access to really powerful cloud services. 50 gigabyte mailboxes. We've recently made an announcement about our OneDrive for Business product, which is included in Office 365. You used to get 25 gigabytes of storage online with that. It's now a terabyte for every single employee that takes a subscription. So you get an incredible amount of storage. Update the service very, very regularly. Access on multiple devices, whether that is Microsoft devices or somebody else's. And we're seeing incredible adoption from all sorts of customers and all sorts of segments in moving to the cloud with us in Office 365. So why does all this matter? Um, you know, I've talked a lot about the trends and I've talked a lot about the fact that Microsoft is investing in those things and kind of the things that we think are important for us. But actually, what, when we look at how customers use technology and how they adopt it, it actually has an impact. Their attitude towards technology and what they adopt has an impact on how fast they grow, how many jobs they create, and their long-term success. Um, so this was conducted uh, internationally, so not just the UK, but, um, and it was done on behalf of Microsoft by Boston Consulting Group. But it was conducted anonymously. So the people responding didn't know that they were answering questions for Microsoft. Uh, they didn't know that we were going to find out. And the trends pretty much span every kind of vertical, every segment, every geography. And irrespective, the gender comment is it doesn't matter who's running the organization. There is no gender split in the attitude. Like the more you think about and invest in technology, the faster you're growing, the more jobs that you're creating. And when at the end of that survey, again, they don't know it's Microsoft, we asked who they see as being the, a key provider for them in order to, to run their businesses. And Microsoft comes up as their number one. They, they think about us and they turn to us when they're thinking about how to invest in technology that helps them be more effective. And obviously for us, that's very exciting. Um, and we think that we're investing in the things that are helping small businesses particularly change the way they work, change the way they use technology and helping them grow and be more efficient. So I, I started off by saying it was a slightly grand title around business reimagined. Really the point I guess is that technology is changing so quickly that we can easily get stuck into, okay, well, you know, I've been running my business five years, 10 years, 20 years, this is kind of how we do it. Given all of the change in technology and the way that it's changing and the access that you have, that your employees have, you know, the impact of being better connected, if you were to stop and start again, would you do it that way now? Maybe, in which case, great. But if you think that actually by adopting technology in a, in a more imaginative, more effective, more exciting way, 
then you could be fueling your business, fueling your employees better, help you work more effectively, uh, be more productive, then great opportunity to take today, listen to what everybody has to say, but go away and start thinking about <coughs> what changes you could make in order to help realize some of those benefits in your organization. And so just to wrap up, you know, I think it is all about enabling people. How do you weave that technology together, whether it's across social and building those connections, whether it's across better insight from your data, or enabling people to work more flexibly from wherever it is that makes sense for them. But think about people as the heart. How do you amplify their impact? How do you enable them to be most successful? And I think if we can go on and do that and use technology to be more effective, then that's really where we'll go after some of that, you know, the, the anticipated economic benefit of, I think it was 13 billion pounds. Right, how do you go and get some of that and make sure that you're, you're in the right place to, to have a thriving organization in Cheshire? So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.